Let's see. Yes, lights on. We are here. Hello. I'm back on my phone because I got the death, the, what do you want to call it, the swirl of death going. I'm starting to think that they um, do strange things with my Wi-Fi at night because this happens when I'm on late at night. But I am here. I am very late tonight. I had a lot going on today. It was a rough day at work. <laughs> Just so much to do. And not enough time to do it. And then uh, when I came home, I just was mindless for a while. Oh, excuse me. And so I'm just now coming upstairs. Um, but I'm going to get this done, guys, because I am committed to not being behind. So um, we are going to get started in about a minute or so. Um, I'm still working on, but I have some goals of when this morning is going to start now. But I am working on moving us to the morning. Um, I have a vacation coming up in June, and I'm thinking that will be a good transition point um, to start working before and after that to get us moved to the morning. So I will let you know. I will keep you posted, or you will just see it start in the morning, but I can definitely guarantee you there will not be a video in the morning uh, for sure because I will not be, uh, I will not have time in the morning for a video. But we are going to get started. We are starting a new book of the Bible. So um, here we go. Okay, my computer is acting crazy and I don't want it to uh, interfere. All right, so here we go. Remember, we did Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Ezra, and we are on Nehemiah, the 16th book of the Bible. Yes, we are on Nehemiah and... Uh, Oh, I'm so sorry, guys. I'm shaking out of it, I promise you. Um, and Nehemiah is the 16th book of the Bible, and just a lot of interesting um, history. Nehemiah is written um, about a thousand years after Moses, guys. Can you believe it? I'm trying to put you in the right frame of mind of where we are in the time of things. Um, so we're about a thousand years after Moses. So from... Um, Genesis to now, right? Or Exodus, I should say. From Exodus to now, it's been like about a thousand year span. Um, and so where have we come from? Well, we've gone so far, right? Um, from Moses and the Exodus and the promise of the promised land to them actually going to the promised land um, with um, all of the covenant of God saying these are the blessings if you do and the curses if you don't um, for them to finally get to the promised land and do the don'ts, right? And so they brought curses down on themselves and God had mercy on them for hundreds of years before he actually um, said that's enough, that's it. Um, and um, 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 right before that, of course, they had... Uh, kings come through. They had David as the first king. Uh, well, Saul, Saul as the first king, but David as the first king after God's own heart. Um, and um, then Saul, um, after David, there was Solomon. After Solomon, his son Rehoboam. But Rehoboam um, splits the kingdom, right? Basically, it was a prophecy from uh, to his father David that the kingdom was split. I mean, to his father Solomon that the kingdom was split because uh, Solomon had um, uh, embraced the don'ts, right? He had gotten uh, these 700 wives, 300 concubines. And, and of course, God said, don't do that because then you're going to follow their gods. And that's exactly what he started doing. Um, and so the, the kingdom was split. Um, and then so we have Judah, we have Israel, we have a whole bunch of bad kings in Israel. We have some good kings and some bad kings in Judah. Uh, uh, Israel is taking over 
by the Assyrians uh, taken captive. Um, they took them all to Assyria and left the poorest people, of course, right? Um, and then only Judah was left. Judah lasted another hundred or so years. Um, and then the Babylonians took them over in 70 years of captivity um, they lived in. And um, then a remnant. So about 3 million people were taken into captivity. I, I'm trying to get you a bigger picture. Um, I go back and I read and I study and I think about all the stuff that I didn't say. So I try to say something new, right? But I don't think I ever told you guys that about 3 million people went into captivity, right? Um, went into Babylon. Uh, I mean, just a huge amount of people. Uh, 3 million or so people went into slavery, captivity, whatever you want to call it. And only about 50,000 came back. Um, 50,000. 50,000. Um, um, so not, so when we say a remnant came back, we really mean a remnant. Now, all of the ones that didn't come back weren't, they weren't killed. It wasn't like they couldn't come back. Some people, um, actually just build houses and land and settle down in Babylon. Um, and they weren't even necessarily serving, um, the gods of Babylon. They may have been serving God himself, but just decided we're just going to stay here, right? This is where my life has been for 70 years. And I'm not going back, right, to whatever God promised. I'm not going back to that. I'm just going to stay here and let the remnant go back and do what they're supposed to do. Um, so only 50,000 came back. And we just finished the book of Ezra that talked about how that 50,000 came back. And they rebuilt the temple of God. And that was Ezra's assignment, so to speak, um, to lead these people back into um, uh, once the temple, you know, he sent people back to rebuild the temple. And once the temple was back, he came up and reset order in the house of God, um, uh, so that things ran like it was supposed to right down to, right down to you guys can't go back to, uh, you know, marrying foreign wives again. And so at the end of Ezra, um, they took care of all of the men that had married these foreign wives, right? Um, now we're opening up with Nehemiah. Nehemiah actually starts about 15 years after Ezra ends, right? And so 15 years after the book of Ezra ends, Nehemiah starts. And so we're talking about 100 years um, since they have gone back to Jerusalem. So we're talking 100 years since these 50,000 went back to Jerusalem. And it opens up... Um, in chapter one with uh, Nehemiah basically asking one of the, he, he ran into someone who was from Jerusalem um, and asked them, Hey, so what's going on? You know, how, you know, you know how you, if you ran into somebody from your old hometown, say you're not from here and you run into somebody, right? If I run into somebody from Alabama, you know, I might say what's going on in fed, right? So here's, um, Nehemiah asking, so what's going on, right? What's going on over in Jerusalem? Um, and listen to what they said. He said, they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and distress. The disgrace, the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. And so if you remember when Nebuchadnezzar took over, so Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. And when he came in and took over and, and started um, uh, sending all of Israel over to Babylon, they burned down the temple and they burned down the walls. Um, and when these 50,000 of the exile went back as a remnant, they rebuilt the temple. They tried to rebuild the walls, but were stopped. And when they were stopped, they never tried to rebuild them again. So the temple was rebuilt, but the wall never got rebuilt. And in those days, if you lived in a city that didn't have a wall, you were just asking for trouble, right? Uh, 
Um, if you're if you uh, were in a city that that didn't have walls, then you know people were just bandits, warriors, everybody from all other countries and little cities and little towns and whatever you want to call them would just come in and steal your stuff because there's nothing. There's no, no barrier to you in the outside world, right? So they could just, you know, come in while you're sleeping and just steal all your stuff and then, you know, leave. And so they were in a constant state of disgrace disgrace and trouble because they didn't have any protection. They didn't have any walls. They didn't have um, um, anything that could protect them from uh, outside bandits, right? And so when Nehemiah heard this, the Bible says he cried. Listen to what it says. Verse 4. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days, I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. So he he was distraught by this. Um, although he was in Babylon serving the king, we're going to find out. Um, he was distraught. By what was going on, right? So he 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 wept. He cried over Jerusalem. He cried over what was happening to the people there, and what was happening to the remnant. And then he prayed. So um, it reminds me of that um, scripture in Ezra, where Ezra talked about how he cried and cried, and then when he finished crying, he got up and he prayed. He did something, right? He said, "I didn't just um, um, you know uh, sit there." Uh, in my self-loathing, right? But after I um, finished weeping and mourning, I actually got up and I prayed. I did something, right? Um, and here is Nehemiah doing the same thing. Um, and in his prayer, if you read his prayer, and it starts at verse 5 of chapter 1 and goes to the end. But if you read his prayer, um, it talks about uh, the first thing he does after, you know, praising the Lord for being who he is, um, he actually repents for the people. Um, so he repents for uh, Jerusalem and um, he confesses sins for himself and for Jerusalem, right? So in verse uh, six, it says, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer. Your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. So, see, Nehemiah is reaching out and he's going to repent. He's like, Lord, I'm weeping out for you. I'm repenting for me. I'm repenting for the city. I'm repenting for the other Israelites. I'm repenting for my ancestors. I'm repenting for everybody, right? Um, then he reminds God of his words. And I love this because um, a lot of times when we pray, we do the, the crying out part, right? We cry, we weep, we mourn, we snot, we do all of that part. Um, and then we get up off our knees and say, in Jesus' name, amen, as if that's it, right? Um, we don't let our requests be made known unto God. And we don't remind God of his word. And so right after he gets through with all of this repentance, repentance is not the end, it's the beginning. Repentance is not the end, it is the beginning. Repentance is not the end, it is the beginning. So repentance shouldn't be the, the be all of your prayer. And then you just get up off your knees and then that's it, right? Repentance opens the door for you to have communication with God. And so it is the beginning. Once you repent, now you can open up the door and say, okay, God, now, now let that's out the way. And I know you're a good God and I know you're merciful and I know you've forgiven me. Now let me, uh, let my request be made known unto you, right? And so he reminds God of his word. Listen in verse eight, he says, remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling place for my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, 
and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. And so he's repenting first. And then after he repents, he goes to God and says, look, God, this is what you said. You said that even after we messed up, that if there was an exile of us that were willing to go back with a heart for you, that you would pull us back and that you would take care of us when we got back, right? And so he's reminding God of his word. And then he's basically saying, God, help me while I go talk to this man. And then very casually, um, and we believe that Nehemiah was the writer of this, or that Ezra maybe wrote it from some memoirs that it, that Nehemiah had. Um, but at, very casually at the end of this, you know, this prayer, he says, oh, by the way, I was the cupbearer to the king, right? Uh, which is a, a treasure position, right? Which basically meant um, as a cupbearer for the king, um, the king had a cup, right? He would bring the king his cup. He would drink from the cup first, make sure it wasn't poison, and then give it to the king. So that was his job, right? To literally die for the king if, if necessary. Um, so it was a very trusted position. Um, and so he goes to Artaxerxes, who's the king at the time, um, in his cupbearer position, working his job as always. But because um, Artaxerxes, know, the king knows his servant, the king is like, why are you sad and you're not sick? What is going on that you're sad? And so um, I love what happens next, right? First of all, the king um, is listening to the servant, which is, is, is amazing in itself. Um, and it says, and this, I love this verse, right? Verse two, um, um, I'll read you what the king says first. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. And this is what I love. Listen to what he says here. I was very much afraid. I was very much afraid. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face um, not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruin? And so I love this scripture because so often we think that if we feel fear, that means we're supposed to stop and that we're not supposed to go forward and we're not supposed to say what's in our heart and we're not supposed to do what's in our heart. But here Nehemiah is saying, I was very much afraid. <laughs> like, I don't, don't get it twisted. Don't think that I was so brave in this moment. Oh, Nehemiah, you were just so brave to speak up. Nehemiah said, don't get it twisted. I was very much afraid, very much afraid. But yet and still, I spoke up. I said what was necessary to be said. And because he spoke up, the king actually asked him, what do you want? Right? What do you want? Can you imagine the king is asking the servant? You know that's the hand of God. The king is asking the servant, what do you want? That is the hand of God. And so when the king asked him this, Nehemiah didn't just open his mouth and start talking. Well, see what I need for you to do is, no, Nehemiah still consulted God first. The Bible says, then I prayed to the God of heaven. Right now, think about this. He's standing before the king. The king asks him what he wants. He says, then I pray to the God of heaven. We're not talking about that he got on his knees or on his face and said, hold on, king, wait one second. Let me go see what I want. He didn't get on his knees and his face then and say, oh, Lord, God of heaven, you are the most beautiful God and the most excellent God. You are a righteous king. And Lord, we love you so much. And Lord, no, this wasn't the time where he just got on his knees and prayed for an hour and then got up off his knees and said, okay, um, this is what I want. No, this is one of those prayers that you do in your heart really quick when you don't know what to say, right? Have you ever been there? Have you ever been there? When the Lord, uh, when you need the Lord to answer now, somebody asked you a hard question or a question you weren't expecting or a question you really don't know the answer to or a question you know you shouldn't be answering on your own because God sent you there in the first place, right? Um, and so I'm sure, I mean, this don't even require closed eyes. It's just a meditation of the heart. 
Okay, Lord, he's asking me what I want. What should I say? Right? Just a quick acknowledgement of God. Lord, whatever the next words are that come out of my mouth, let them be what you want to ask, right? I mean, this is quick here um, when he says, and I pray to the God of heaven. Um, and then he said, and I answered the king. So I prayed to the God of heaven. Then I answered the king. And this is what he says. If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. And then he goes on to say, can you also, um, you know, send me with a letter so anybody stopping me along the way will know what I'm going for. And by the way, can you also give me a letter to the guy over there with the construction company so I can get the wood that I need to rebuild the gates um, and the walls so I can get it from him, right? So, I mean, he just asked. Ask, ask, because he knows God is with him. Um, and he says that exactly in verse 8 at the very end. He says, and because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my request. Because the hand of God was on me, the king granted my request. Because the hand of God was on me, right? So don't think it was anything that I did on my own. Don't think it was because of the way I asked. Don't think it's because I was so good to the king, right? All of that may be true, but that is not why he granted my request. He granted my request because the hand of God was upon me. And we need to realize that a lot of what happens in our life has nothing to do with our own, um, you know, uh, prowess, right? It's not because we're so great because we're so grand or any of that. It's because the hand of God is upon us. The grace of God is on us. The favor of God is in us, right? And it's because of all of these things that we're able to go forward. And we need to acknowledge that the same way that Nehemiah acknowledged it so beautiful. He was like, look, I know this wasn't me. This had nothing to do with me. This was because the hand of God was upon me. Now, uh, what you'll notice right away at um, in verse 10 is that when you're trying to do something good for the Lord, enemies are not far away, right? And so it says Sam Ballot um, and Tobiah, uh, when they heard about it, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. So they were disturbed that somebody was coming to do something about uh, the walls that were broken down, right? Um, and um, so they had already, you know, voiced their disgruntlement when they heard about it. And so now they're planning and plotting on what they're going to do with this disgruntlement that they have, right? In the meantime, Nehemiah um, goes to Jerusalem uh, with the king's approval, with the letter from the king, with provisions um, from the king. He goes um, but he doesn't just immediately go and gather all the people and start a meeting. And I love the way he did this too. He didn't go and blow a trumpet and say, everybody from Israel, come. We're about to rebuild this wall, right? First he went and he did a survey of the land. And the Bible says that he kind of rode around by himself. He didn't tell anybody why he was there. Um, he didn't make a grand entrance. Look, God, the favor of God is on me to do this project. He didn't He didn't go in like that, right? He just went in pretty much counting up the cost in the beginning. Let me survey the land. Let me see what actually needs to be done. Let me count up the cost. Did I get enough from the construction guy? Did I, you know, am I going to need more? Let me count up the cost of what, what it's really going to take to complete this work, right? And then once he counted up the cost, um, then that's when he called everybody together. Uh, verse 17 in chapter 2 says, Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in, Jerusalem. Um, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been buried, burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king has said to me. Um, and then listen at the people. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. And that right there is going to be our memory verse. It's going to be chapter 2, 
verse 18b. And I love it. And B is just means it's after the period. Because I love the people's heart right here. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. And so the people didn't question him. You know, you after you come from a time uh, with the Israelites and Moses, and, and they're questioning almost every single thing he did, right? Here, the people are just like, whatever. Let's do this. Let's start rebuilding, right? Um, their hearts were there. Uh, but don't forget, just because your heart is there don't mean that your enemies will leave you alone. Um, so the enemy, um, the more they work, the more the enemy worked, right? And so now the enemy is mocking them and making fun of them. It's like, what is this you think you're doing, right? Are you uh, thinking that you're going to, um, you know, rise up against the king? What's happening, right? So they're trying to rise up stuff among others so that they can get a crew of people who um, are against this, right? And then chapter three, um, the entire chapter is just devoted to telling you who built what, wall, where, right? So it tells you, um, you know, to have different names, you know, for the different gates and the walls. And they tell you they're describing the walls by what gates they're near, right? And so, um, um, if you remember um, when the temple was originally built, there were three gates in the east and three gates in the west and three gates in the north and three gates in the south. Do you remember that? So these gates are doors, right? So there were three gates, east, west, north, south, right? Um, and so he's describing how and each of these gates had a name. And so he's describing um where people are building based on those gates. All right. So when you see the names of those gates, it's the names of the 12 gates, the three here, the three there, the three there. Right. Um, and um, we're not going to go through and, and talk anything specifically about chapter three. I do want to bring up this point, though. It is a wonderful chapter to read uh, because you get the sense of togetherness that's happening in chapter four. Um, um, you, you know, everyone is doing their parts, right? Um, and, um, I mean, you got, you know, people who are building up the walls that's near their own houses, right? It makes sense. Um, you got the priests that are putting in time. You have others that are putting in time, servers and workers, and everybody's just putting in time. Um, the Levites, everybody's just putting in time to build up the wall, right? And then you, um, if you read, you'll notice it'll say one section of people building up a wall. And then, you know, about uh, 15, 20 verses down, you'll see that person's name again because they've chosen to go on to another section and build up that wall as well. And so they're building up walls and they're repairing the gates and they're restoring the doors and they're putting back the locks on and they're making it safe um, and they're building it this way, right? Because um, um, this the... Uh, scripture tells us, you know, and I believe in chapter four, actually, um, about when the gate get, when the walls get about halfway up, right? So they're building them upward, right? Um, but then um, the enemies turn up the heat, right? So up to this point, they've been talking uh, and mocking them. Um, but now they turn up the heat and now they are threatening them, right? They're mocking God and threatening them. And so verse four says, when Sam, <coughs> when Sam Valley heard that we were rebuilding the wall, <coughs> sorry, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore the wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Um, and they said, you know, they keep mocking on what they're building. Even a fox climbing on it is going to break it down. Right. And I love what happens next. And I know I keep saying this about Nehemiah, but it just keeps making these wonderful choices. Right. Uh, because when Nehemiah hears that they're talking about him, Nehemiah doesn't go back to them and go toe to toe with them. I'm going to say it again. I really need some saints to hear this part. Open up your ears and hear this part. When Nehemiah's haters, come on, let's put it in today's 
you know, uh, wordage so you really get it. When Nehemiah's haters start hating on him, he does not go to them and go toe to toe with them. That's not what the word of God says. It, it, this is what it says in verse four. He started praying, hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight. For they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. He took it straight to God. He was like, God, I don't know what you're going to do about this, but this is what they're doing. Right? He took it straight to God. And we've got to learn how not to get so caught up in our haters, so caught up in what people are saying about us or what people think about us or what people wrote about us on social media. And I know she was talking about me when she said, I mean, we got to, you know, don't put my, don't put your name, my name in your mouth, right? We got to get over all of this and become like Nehemiah. When there is opposition against us, we pray, we pray for them, right? And we don't always necessarily pray against them because because Nehemiah prayed specifically against them, but we know the word in Matthew 6 that Nehemiah didn't have yet that says, pray for those that despitefully misuse you, right? And so we pray, right? We pray. Um, and so the, the building of the wall did not stop. And the, the Bible says that people were just building the wall with all their heart. Uh, but then there came some threats, right? Um, and it became a little bit more, whoa, wait a minute, what are we doing, right? Um, because they, uh, the haters, their enemies, took it a step further and began to start threatening to kill them, threatening to like plant people um, in there to do the work with them and then kill them. I mean, so it got dangerous. But guess what? Nehemiah still prayed. In verse 9, it says, but we prayed to our God. And posted a guard day and night to meet his threat. Day and night to meet this threat. We posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. And so even though um, um, they were praying, the Bible was, um, the Bible someplace in the New Testament says, watch as well as pray. So they were praying, but we also going to post this guard right here. Because if a threat comes, we're going to be ready to meet the threat. Is what was said. And then from the rest of this uh, chapter, you see that uh, Nehemiah is really setting them up to make sure that they're, that nobody is sneaking them. And so he has guards that's on, on duty at night. He has half the men working and the other half of the men watching to make sure that nothing is coming. Everybody is strapped with something so that if something jump off, they can throw down their, their wood on the ground and pick up, pick their sword up or pick their knife up or whatever they need to do to fight in a moment's notice. Um, um, Sam Bala wants them to know that they're threatened, but Nehemiah wants them to know that their God is going to take care of them. And so um, he tells them um, in verses 13, he says, Therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest point of the walls at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your homes. So he's like, look, don't be afraid of them. Then in another place, he says, um, um, not only did he arm them, but he had one person with a trumpet that he kept with him all the time. And this is what he told the people. Verse 20, wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. Right. And so Nehemiah is saying, don't worry about it. God has our back. Um, um, you go with your swords. I, uh, we got people watching your back while you work, right? So it's not just you blindly working. Somebody's watching your back while you work. But if you hear that trumpet, because we're all spread out, um, you know, Jerusalem 
was spread out and these gates were spread out so people could be working on the north side and, and other people working way on the west side and um uh, nehemiah was just walking around making sure that everything that was okay and so if the trouble came nehemiah had the trumpeter with her with him and he said listen if you hear me blow this trumpet you better come to where you hear the trumpet and we all gonna fight together god's gonna take care of us he will rise up and fight for us right um and so Verse 21 says, so we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn to the stars came out. Um, then he goes on to say um, how they, you know, they had guards at night. They didn't even, they slept in their clothes. They was always ready. And so uh, Nehemiah was dedicated, committed to getting this work done no matter what what and that's how we have to be with the things of god we have to be committed to get the work done no matter what it doesn't matter who our enemies are um, we're not uh building a realistic wall right um, um but we are sometimes rebuilding ourselves and we let our enemies come uh, in and mock us and tell us that we can't do what god has already clearly given us permission to do um, and we will stop the rebuilding of ourselves because we're being mocked by other people. And we can't do that, guys. We have to continue to rebuild. We have to set up guards. Um, there's a scripture in Proverbs that says, um, guard your heart for out of it flows the issues of life, right? We've got to set up guards around our heart so that we don't let everybody in, so that we don't, you know, let all the haters, you know, uh, talk, uh, the talk that they have affect us every kind of way. We've got to continue to do what God says do no matter what. Excuse me, I'm sorry. We have to continue to do what God says do no matter what. And that means setting up guards. That means pushing forward. That means staying up late at night, praying our way through. Whatever we got to do, we've got to continue to do it. We got to have the commitment of Nehemiah to get it done. When we uh, come back tomorrow, we're going to read four more chapters in Nehemiah. We're going to talk about um, um, how his enemy conspired even more. Um, and how Nehemiah uh, was even the more committed. Um, and then we're going to talk about the completion of the wall um, and um, um, how even more exiles are coming back to Jerusalem after the completion of that wall. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk about all of that um, on tomorrow. So um, you be blessed until then and know that I love you and God loves you too. In Jesus name. Amen.